Thanks everyone for showing up. And um, yes, yeah, so um, my back background is in structural geology, so I've always, you know, in conflict with geophysics a little bit. <laughs> but that's fine. So before you get your hands on your data, what I'd like to talk about is, you know, our perspective on, on airborne AM and, and geophysical acquisition um, in, in general. So obviously, we've almost covered the, the state in the 20 kilometer lines. It's just, I think, at the end of, the, of end of October is when the final uh, lines will be flown. And then I think we're looking at what, later in the year, maybe December, to, to, release, to release the data. Yeah. So acquisition at that stage is a strategic decision. So you know, what, what is it we're doing at the GSWA? And, and um, we've recently defined a geoscience strategy. So what's the scientific, where, where, do we, where does, does our uh, scientific work sit strategically? And what, what we're really about is acquiring data and, and adding relevance and context to provide information packages and then later on providing knowledge products um, where we also add significance and experience from, from our staff and from our learnings. So one of the things here is that, that the, uh, the um, AEM sits somewhere between the, the data and the information, acquiring the data itself, but adding context and, and relevance to that and then releasing that. And, and that has a flow on effect. Um, you cannot really predict what will happen with that data. You can have uh, individual success stories coming out of that, but overall, um, strategically, what we want to do, of course, is provide competitive, pre-competitive data, and have as many people come and and uh, come into into the state, explore, and and be successful. Right. So it's not we, we really cherish the individual uh, success stories, but we also want to have a longer-term um, outlook on on our investment in in data and specifically in, in geophysics. So we have a long history of, of going for coverage and improving coverage. This goes back to the first maps that were published in 1910. You know, um, so the, the, the infill of geological information, people riding you know, on camels and mapping, mapping the state. We actually have a few camel saddles still in, 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 the, in the field logistics area. Um, and, and so, all the way to the last map that was published in 2015, which is, which is fully um, digital GIS product can be updated, and this is this is just one example. The other example, of course, is the um, is the increase in potential field data, and you know you all know what it means. You guys are better than I do. What it means to have better resolution, and and you know how you can improve um, the data that you look at and your your um, the impact. That, that it has if you process it better and if you collect it better and you, have a, and you have a better resolution. So we are really expanding that, that um, not just from potential field, we, we are interested of course in the, in the Airborne EM, but, but we also um, do that, we've always done that with surface geochemistry, so we have a number of products that uh, speak to that. But also recently, we found that um, we're doing this um, with um, isotopes, particularly samarium, neodymium. This is a collaboration we've done with GA for a long time. Um, but, but recently, having been able to, to infill um, the isotopic data, samarium, neodymium, lutetium, hafnium, but also uh, oxygen and zircon, has been, has been really important together with geodynamic scale data, uh, something like the Mohort also geochemistry in, in granites and in green, <laughs> green stones. So we are trying to get coverage and we're kind of trying to, uh, from, from the uh, state coverage, uh, get more and more data to, to better define the subsurface. And not just the, the shallow subsurface, but really um, you know, the, the information at depth, crustal thickness, um, velocity structure of WA, these, as we know from, from the uncover, you're mapping the entire lithosphere is really important to understand geodynamic evolution. So integrating, so it's the one thing is the challenge is collect the data in terms of the, um, the isotopes, for, insta for instance, in the picture you see on the top left, uh, we have now been able to better delineate the, um, the, the difference between the Pilbara and the Patterson. And this is based on, on um, drill core that went through the canning basin and hit basement. So we took the zircons out there, 
determine the age, but also the, the hafnium isotopes and things like that, we can now see that they come from a different uh, genomic background, a different, uh, have a different, drastically different crustal evolution, and um, basically the Patterson has actually split between a Pilbara part and uh, uh, something we call the uh, Percival Lakes province, which is a more like juvenile area. So there's things like that that uh, sit well also with uh, things like the seismic lines we do, and, and uh, we have a, a, a very large program, WA Array, that in the next 10 years will collect passive seismic on a 40 kilometer grid and across the entire state that was announced by the minister earlier, earlier this year. So uh, we're really serious about uh, getting all time, kinds of data together. Of course, the challenge will be, will be to integrate that into, into uh, useful full models for, for exploration and for understanding the geology of the state. Okay, so um, our objective is to really create information infrastructure for, for the explorers, but also for the wider scientific community and for, for government to make decisions about land use. And, and so if we look back, as I said before, you know, we've, we've increased the coverage of, of geological mapping. Uh, we've worked with GA to improve the, the resolution of potential field data. Um, <laughs> We have programs of, to increase coverage of surface geochemistry, and we are embarking, as I said before, on passive seismic, MT, uh, isotopes, geochronology, and petrophysical data as well. So we've recently started to, um, to uh, acquire petrophysical da data uh, in, a, in a standardized way. Went out for tender, and we have a, we have a company who measures uh, seven or eight properties, and we're trying to expand that uh, across the state as, as much as possible. The challenge here, of course, we don't have uh, a proper database at the moment or structure where we can integrate that with other data, but we are looking to, to do that uh, in the future as well. Um, and of course, you know, we also have done the same thing with the AEM. We, we went on, on board with this, with this proposal from, from GA, and this, of course, is the subject of the workshop. So this is the background in a way. And, and really, um, it was a bold decision to do that, right? To do the 20 kilometer spacing, and we, we commend, commend um, uh, GA for doing that. And, and re I mean, there were a lot of people that were very skeptical about it, right? And, and I think that uh, what we, even by, by looking at some of the data just on the big posters that were, were shown everywhere, it's quite clear that um, the consistency across the lines regionally gives a lot of confidence for people, even, even if their area is somewhere in between two of the lines, you know, you, you can still look at the line and say, okay, this is, this is nice, and, and I've got some background, I've, get, I've got spatial context, and I can now infill with a bit more confidence, makes it, makes it a bit uh, easier to do that. And it also does provide large-scale information, which is really useful. And uh, I think particularly the Northern Territory, the EFTF work has shown that quite nicely that, that GA have done. So what we found is that we've got a few people looking at this, and um, some of the results are really consistent with and can really great, uh, greatly aid geological uh, mapping. <clears throat> so yeah, clearly, smaller-scale surveys can be put into spatial context, and this is one of the big outcomes, I think, for us. Uh, in, in, the, in the survey. So yeah, of course there was a few uh, exploration success stories in nickel and gold uh, announced in March. I think it was Buxton Resources and um, who else? There were Rubik's and, and Torque Metals who, who very quickly found that uh, it was very useful in, on, on their tenement areas. And as I say, we, we like that idea, but, but um, we have this general idea that we want to provide data for, for and, and attract people to, to uh, invest more and, and, to, and to then have the confidence to do infill, for instance, infill studies and things like that. And that's specifically st uh, stated in one of the press releases that, that gave them the, the confidence to actually fly uh, AM at, a, at, a higher, at a higher resolution. <coughs> so it's very valuable. <clears throat> and you know, just a few snapshots. Uh, Alex Jan from the Basin and Energy Group at GSWO is working on, on some of this, and he's shown some um, He's uh, looked at some uh, geological areas that are actually difficult to, to, uh, to approach and to map. It's the East Kimberley, it's the Oort Basin, uh, the, uh, the Paleozoic uh, there, and, and uh, has given him a lot of confidence using the AM to actually map the, the structure of, of the Oort Basin. That, um, so he found that a lot of the data was quite useful for that. Another example is looking at um, MVT in the Canning Basin, looking at, uh, at the, um, 
faults, alteration um, of the um, Mississippi Valley type let zinc deposits there and you know going in from from larger scale into smaller scale and then uh, we found it quite useful there are other examples we will have a, um, a, a, a record a record uh, released on that very very soon um, you can also see the Ellendale pipes and things like that so you know because the, the line was actually flown over it but still um, you know it's it's quite it's quite useful for that as well and and another example is something that that um, uh, Corolla Cor uh, also talked about before salt diapirs. Here, you know, where you have an example from the from the Canning Basin, you have um, an area that was that had seismic lines across it and an A1EM flown flown on top of it. Um, so Wulnov Wulnov diapir, and and um, yeah. So basically, this is what you see what you see in the seismic and the gamma gamma ray. So you can already see that it's quite good. Um, in, you get some indication of, of what you're looking at, but but then you know with the um, with the airborne EM you get a much better way of imaging that, and that of course is very important. We all know that that um, um, salt is really sought after at the moment, particularly for for the op for option to store um, store hydrogen uh, or or sequester CO2 and store that in there. So I think. Uh, this is really important. So here you can actually uh, use the, the data to see that you can have more confidence of understanding that uh, um, what the age of the salt movement is, uh, and and by you know tying in the stratigraphy and the structure using the airborne EM. So this is really all I'd have to say. Um, so the key benefits for us is the regional consistency that really shows the value of the method for us. Um, that provides the users with the confidence to undertake smaller scale surveys. Um, we, we think it can be integrated very well with other methods, and of course we like trying to look at that more case, case studies and like to see you guys use it and, and, and hope you find it useful. And you know, it is really a part of the GSWA strategy to provide statewide um, information infrastructure, get more and more better data that can be integrated and used for, for exploration and, and, and decision making in that in that kind of space. If you have any questions, ask now or approach me through, do the, uh, during the, the, the breaks. Always happy to, to help you guys. Thanks.